Wow, Gene, uh, thanks so much for coming out to San Francisco for the Open Group event. And God, we've been talking to each other now for how long? Twelve years, I think. We met in 2004 uh, at the ITSMF conference uh, in Washington, so. D.C. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's funny how many of those themes about you know, work intake, work prioritization, queuing, you know, how this actually showing up in IT for IT. And I've been an admirer mm -hmm. of your work for many, many years. In fact, uh, your book, uh, The Cobbler's... Uh, yeah, uh, Cobbler's Children, yeah. About architects, you know, yeah. uh, and architecture. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, uh, uh, I think it was just a seminal book, and I'm so delighted to see so many of the concepts that you were proposing back then now really being uh, adopted industry-wide in IT for IT. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been uh, it's been an interesting journey, certainly. Right, and so, yeah. if you don't, so what made, uh, if you don't mind me asking, uh, yeah. Uh, what made IT for IT, what, what caught your interest and what made it seem so promising to you? What was the earliest indication for you? Well, they were clearly going down a, a similar route and I'd actually had some indirect influence on it that I did not realize. It's a long story, but the people who were working on IT for IT were also aware of my work and had the book about how to use tools like value streams, value stream mapping in understanding digital delivery. But certainly when I looked at what they'd done and I looked at the, the value stream approach, I thought it was more compelling than, than what I had done. I mean, I still believe that, I mean, I had taken a value stream approach with log life cycles. I said, well, we've got an asset life cycle, a tech product life cycle, a service life cycle. And I still think there's merit in thinking about it that way. But when I saw what Lars Rawson and team had done with uh, strategy portfolio, requirement to deploy, request to fulfill, detect, and correct, I said, well, that's also an orthogonal and, and very compelling way of understanding the different domains of practice we have. And it makes sense and it's held up. I mean, I'm very critical. I look at stuff like that, I'm like, okay, can I disprove that? You know, because that's all it takes is one dis point of disproof. I've not yet seen the point of disproof on those value streams. One of the Zen paradoxes for me, if I can use that word, in doing IT for IT and also being very interested in tracking the Agile and related DevOps progress over the years has been the ideas of standards, frameworks, bodies of knowledge. They're not that well regarded in certain seg segments of the Agile community. Um, and, you know, I kind of just deal with that contradiction on a daily basis and I look at, you know, things like scaled Agile framework and some of the controversies that have swirled around it. Right, and, and so what I find exciting and, and, and it was yeah. totally, I, I guess, uh, it's interesting to me that there's so many people from the ITIL and service management community mm -hmm. um, uh, as part of this effort. and. You know, what a better group of people to be able to say, all right, here's a larger world to operate in, mm -hmm. you know, than sort of classical IT service management. Right. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, to maybe directly um, answer your question about, like, you know, there are certain segments, you know, in DevOps, in that Agile, that are, I think, very uh, hostile towards training, certification, standards. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they came to the world of rational, unified mm -hmm. process and all of that. Um, yeah. uh, I, I guess I... Uh, I, I, I think they're a minority, and I think mm -hmm. the rest are, um, you know, as mentioned, was mentioned earlier today, it's like they they, can, they have more than one job left to go, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, yep. They have sometimes deep uh, mm -hmm. feelings about uh, what do I need to do to stay relevant, and yep. you know, they have a, a vague feeling that automation mm -hmm. and DevOps and Agile have something to do with it. Yeah. Boy, any place where we can be much more explicit about yeah. that, here's guidance, here's stuff to learn, yep. uh, that's, that's hugely yeah. valuable. You know, <clears throat> what excites me about being here today is, you know, uh, you and I have shared our, you know, have told our share of architect jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I've long believed that, uh, you know, architecture has been over-delegated and that, you know, yeah. uh, some of the biggest sins of how we manage technology has happened because, you know, we've totally ignored the architectural function. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of my biggest learnings is, uh, I mean, just a little, Ralph Lauren, he was the CIO for HP, later HPE, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, so a Fortune 20 company. Right. And, you know, he said, you know, what we need is buoys, not boundaries, right? So it's kind of using the, you know, river channel mm -hmm. metaphor. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, yes. The, uh, exactly. You know, the days of, like, mandatory uh, practices, mandatory processes, mandatory tools. Right. And I think those days are over, um, mm -hmm. that is really about an internal marketplace of ideas. But on the other right. hand, right. Uh, the goal is how do you maximize developer productivity by giving them these very safe channels to go down yes, and also exactly. giving them permission to right. you know, stray outside, outside right. the channel um, and you know, even saying, 
you know, uh, you understand the business objective better than anybody. If that's what you need to do, mm -hmm. do it. Um, right. And that might be the next source of innovation that we have to integrate into our exactly. enterprise architecture. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And I think that, that architecture, it will not go away. You know, there's, there's still a need for it. As you say, it's chief architects who are coming to the DevOps Enterprise Summit, which was one of the really surprising findings. <laughs> Maybe think there's actually hope here, but, you well, know. Probably just, just to clarify yeah. this, so I, you yeah. know, I, I, I talk to these uh, people that, I mean, so you know, one of the, in my mind, the, uh, the words that come to my mind when I think of chief architect, it's, uh, they're global thinkers, not mm -hmm. local, local right. uh, thinkers, right? They tend to be more abstract than yes. concrete, and I actually, uh, and tend to be global abstract. Mm -hmm. So these are, um, so no wonder they're seeing kind of the need for right. uh, these, uh, uh, to see these problems that are yeah. truly end-end problems. Um, um, so I think you have to say, well, what is architecture trying to do? And, you know, what are the value drivers? How do you quantify it better? I've, I've been putting some thoughts together, and I think it still is a challenge for the architecture community. You saw a little bit today on how I look at um, the quantifying the value of just limiting the technology portfolio, which is only one small part of what architects do. Yeah. But yet, you know, vendor diversity, platform diversity, it's a problem, it's a cost. Okay. One of the things you also observed is that developers are compensated financially and in terms of the experience you give them. You can call it resume padding, and I used that term earlier today, but the thing is, is it's legitimate because at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to hire top tier talent if all you're running is COBOL, and you have to pay, you pay an economic cost for making decisions like that. Yeah, yeah, in fact, I love that presentation from earlier today for, uh, from uh, uh, Simple and Learn. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Pike, and uh, just uh, the CEO of AT&T saying, you know, we want, uh, we need every engineer to spend mm -hmm. five to 10 hours a week learning right. new skills, and uh, I thought that was actually, uh, you know, that seemed compelling on so many different reasons, mm -hmm. right? You have to stay relevant, you have yeah. to uh, yeah. accept that we are all lifelong mm -hmm. lifelong learners. Um, right. So yeah, I, I think many people would agree, including the CEO of ATT, it's yeah. like that's, uh, if you yeah. want to stay in the game, uh, yeah. that's the amount of time you need to invest. Okay. Well, Gene, as always, it's been a real pleasure, uh, great to spend time with you, and you know, hopefully we'll do something like this again sooner than later. Absolutely. And again, I learned a lot today, and thanks for having me. And yeah. look forward to, uh, congratulations on all the great work here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Likewise.